introducing you here today. I'm a lucky woman. I have my husband here today and he joins us frequently, but my son, my youngest son, Charlie is also here. Very interested in the topic. So Charlie, it's great to have you here. Um, I want to, on a somber note, I'm gonna change tone a bit. Um, for the second time in three months, I'm compelled to hold a moment of silence. In January, it was for the riots at the Capitol in Washington, DC. And today it is to honor and remember the victims from the Boulder shooting. This event comes on the heels of a mass shooting in Atlanta. So please join me in silence as we remember the 10 members of our state and our community. Thank you. The image on the screen that I shared was, uh, I took from our fellow Rotarian, Peter Tedstrom's Facebook. I thought it was quite beautiful. and wanted to share that with you too. Our Denver Rotary Club Foundation trustees with the support of our club board of directors is developing an action plan and recommendation for our club. I'm also meeting with our district governor this afternoon for district level ideas as well, so stay tuned. So remember, no matter how dark life can get, there is always hope. Hope and true belief that in this world, love universally wins. As the family of Rotary, I ask that each of us move forward in our days and in our tomorrows with a little more grace, empathy, generosity, understanding, and love in our hearts. With that, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag, the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. For our inspirational moment today, I'd like to welcome Mike McPhail. Mike is a Denver Rotary Club Foundation trustee, and he's also a partner with Begray Baker and Daniels. Thanks, Debbie. My wife and I were very fortunate to get our first COVID vaccine shots this week, and it was a very emotional moment for me. And at the risk of appearing self-centered, I wanted to find an inspirational quote that captured the gratitude that I felt. And here it is, courtesy of an LA Times editorial. With the ramping up of the most ambitious immunization operation in US history, the end of the pandemic is in sight. Thank you to the scientists who started working on the vaccine over a year ago, even before it was clear how widespread the pandemic would become. Thank you to the thousands of clinical trial volunteers who risked their health to take an experimental vaccine for the benefit of others. Thank you to the government officials who work to limit the bureaucratic red tape that typically makes vaccine development a years long process and for doing it without compromising safety controls. This unprecedented effort shows that we as a society can still do great things when we work together. I hope this insight can be applied to the many other massive problems our nation faces. Thank you, Mike, I feel it, I feel that. Exactly, so thank you. Next is our club secretary's report. Troy Szymanski is with us today. Troy is a partner and fund manager for Outpost Fund, so Troy. All right, thank you very much, President Debbie. We wanna start off by welcoming some guests. Uh, first off, we have Becky Smith, who is here as a guest of Jim White. And as President Debbie already did, we wanna welcome uh, her son, Charlie Beasley, uh, who is a chemist at the Fort Collins uh, Water. So this is a uh, topic is of great interest to him. Um, if I'm not able to thank you uh, and uh, 
you are joining us for the first time, I do want to say thank you uh, for starting off your Thursday afternoon with Denver Rotary. Some birthdays. Uh, we have a really good distribution of birthdays in the club this week. Uh, so if you'll all join me wishing a happy birthday today and later this week to Chuck, Jay, Carl, Mary, Jeff, Christy, and to Mike Edwards. So send them a message, send them a card, say happy birthday from Denver Rotary. Then some announcements. Uh, our next virtual happy hour will be next Wednesday, March 31st at 5.30 p.m. The Zoom link will be provided in our Tuesday meeting email next week. We'd like to ask you to save the date. On Saturday, April 17th at 9 a.m., join your fellow Rotarians for an active and socially distanced service project, the Cherry Creek Trail, trail Cleanup. Please consider participating to help keep this popular trail clean, safe, and enjoyable for all. So keep an eye out for the registration early next week. Nine Health is looking for volunteers to help out at the Nine Health COVID vaccination sites. At least 10 volunteers at each site each day is desired. This is a safe and important way to serve our community, and if you're inter especially if you're interested and able. Volunteers can sign up to help in four hour segments, morning or afternoon, or a full day. To sign up, please go to ninehealthvolunteer.org and click on help with vaccination clinics and COVID testing. You will need to create an account with the Nine News volunteer site. Once you've done so, you can review the variety of volunteer opportunities, dates, and locations in the notes section. Please indicate Rotary so we can track your dis our district involvement in this effort. And if you have any questions, please contact Lisa Goulias, Mark Whipper, or Debbie Beasley. Finally, the Denver Rotary has supported Metro Caring with volunteers to sort thousands of pounds of food to individuals and families in need. Metro Caring has asked us to spread the word about the upcoming vaccination clinic. This opportunity is in addition to our ongoing support of the Nine News COVID vaccination clinics. They're hosting a second vaccination clinic on Saturday, April 3rd from 8.30 to 4.30 p.m. for those who need to receive their second dose. Metro Caring is attempting to reach out to as many community members as possible and could use additional help throughout the day to help where needed, uh, to help where needed from traffic control to checking people in. They're asking volunteers to come for one shift as opposed to two separate shifts. The Denver Rotary has been a great volunteer supporter of Metro Caring, and they'd love to have our support for the second round of vaccines. If you're interested, please email Dina Duake at, uh, and then there's an email, I'll put this in the chat, um, as well as a phone number and let Dina know your preferred shift. That will be all from me, President Debbie, back to you. All right, thank you, Troy. Next, we have Seth Patterson joining us to talk about an office move announcement. So Seth is our office move task force chair. Did you even know we had an office move task force? Seth is also a past club president. He's also principal and broker of Patterson and Company and uh, with commercial real estate. Thank you. Go ahead, Seth. Oops, you're on mute, Seth. Not yet. Seth, we can't hear you. Debbie, I'm going to go ahead and step in for Seth. I think he's probably having um, some issues with the microphone. Um, the Rotary Office is looking at taking a move. So as you know, at the beginning of this year, we reduced our office staff to just me, um, with Darlene coming in periodically to do our accounting work. Our current 900 square foot office on South Colorado Boulevard is much larger than we need. Um, this is it. I uh, will be once we dispose of stuff and we no longer need digitized paper files that we do not need and find suitable homes for some of our historical memorabilia that we hope to not send to the landfill. Downsizing and moving our office has been the plan ever since Darlene retired and the time has come. Fortunately, our lease expires this September uh, 30th. 
Um, Seth has been asked to be the chair of our moving task force and to help me organize and complete these efforts. Many of you will be asked to assist with various tasks in this effort um, to recall past President Christy Schaefer's theme of please just say yes as myself and Seth ask for your help. In addition, we are reaching out to see if any of you might have or know of a small office within the Denver city limits that would meet our needs. As you consider this, you obviously need to understand our needs. Um, a private office with four walls, um, about 200 square feet, similar services regularly available in co-working executive suite space, um, including accessible, uh, access to a high capacity copier, reliable internet and Wi-Fi services, access to conference rooms, including one that will seat up to about 25 people, nearby affordable parking for myself and for our board and committee meetings, ideally a small and amount of convenient affordable storage space. It will be important that we have a formal lease in place to avoid misunderstandings about the clubs or our landlords expectations and obligations. We will probably be seeking a lease of about three years. Several of you responded to a related email from myself earlier this week with suggestions of co-working options, and we very much appreciate your ideas. We need to locate a space sooner rather than later, so unless realistic options are offered by members within approximately the next 30 days, we'll be moving on to evaluating co-working options with a preference towards the professional rather than casual end of the continuum of settings. If any of you, um, have or know of an option, please let myself or Seth know as soon as possible. Thanks so much. Back to you, President Debbie. All right, thank you. I think I can talk now. Thanks, Lauren. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> good, good, good reading. <laughs> Any, anything to add, Seth? No. All right, thank you. Thank you for heading this up. It'll be really an important thing for us to do. And um, the time is right, so thank you. Bet. All right, so Jill Santuccio is joining us, and Jill is our fundraising VP and also founder of Prism Communications to talk about April Fools on Talent Show. You don't need any special talent to join us and have fun next Thursday night. And the most important talent that you actually do need you have already mastered just by being on this call. All you have to do is log into a Zoom meeting and support various and sundry fellow Rotarians who are gonna put themselves out there and just be a fool on April Fool's Day for Rotary. So if you don't have any talent, doesn't matter. We want you to come and participate and have fun bring your family members, pour yourself a cocktail. And the most, the second most important thing that you can do after logging in and supporting your fellow Rotarians is helping us meet or exceed our $20,000 fundraising goal for DRCF. We have a, um, a very generous anonymous donor who has agreed to match $10,000 if we raise $10,000. Uh, in the lead up between now and the event and before the end of the event. We've had some very nice pledges so far, but we still have a ways to go. So my request from you is the following. If you don't have a talent, just come and have fun. If you do have a talent, you need to sign up. There will be a link in the uh, recap email by five o'clock this afternoon for us to slot you into the agenda. And number three, if you can't make it, we would ask that at a bare minimum, you go on to the DRCF uh, donation page and make a pledge or a donation towards the event for next Thursday so that we can activate that $10,000 challenge gift. That's about all I have. I'll see you next Thursday. Oh, and wear a funny hat because I have a really great hat that I am saving for next Thursday. Thanks, President Debbie. Thanks, Jill. So is Excel spreadsheet, is that a talent or not? Uh, you might have to fight Jim Johnston as to who's okay. All right. with Excel spreadsheets. But okay, I'll well, I'll have to come up with something else. 
<laughs> All right, next is Bed Nanda. Bed is also a Denver Rotary Club Foundation trustee, and he's also the Rotary Foundation support team member. So Bed is a professor of law at DU Sturm College of Law, and he is doing our good news red buckets today. Take it away. Thank you, President Debbie. You began today on a very somber note. And although we heard about the clinics, we heard about um, um, people getting vaccinations, but still today, as we think about Atlanta, as we think about Boulder, as we think about Corona having a, taking a toll, and uh, in Europe, again, spike. So I think there is gloomy picture all around in many instances. And so we need something uplifting. And I'm going to be calling upon my friends, respected Rotarians, to share with us good news so that we can have our hearts be uplifted. And I'm going to begin that Catherine and I both had our second shot and uh, I am teaching still on Zoom and very, very lively and wonderful class. And so that's my good news. And I'm going to put $50, $20 is minimum, but sky is the limit. You can put a thousand dollars, we won't object. So on that happy note, I'm looking around from for some good hands and good news so that we can all feel good. I see a dog. That's <laughs> a good moment. Well, Crimson up. Crimson. Crimson, come. This, I'm doing $20 because of my sleepy dog. <laughs> <laughs> and the Crimson graduated on Tuesday from. I'm not sure, I understand. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, that's it. Who is next? I Jill is next. Yeah. Jill, you already talked about talents. And you are the one who has been able to bring untalented people like me to be ready to come next Thursday. So thank you. I got my first dose of the vaccine this morning. So, I mean, so many of you have um, given money to TRF in, in honor of getting your vaccine. So I'm, I'm not going to drop the ball on that. I will be honest with you, I'm not feeling so great. So I might not make it through the presentation, but I do hope everybody will participate next uh, Thursday, even if you just log on and have fun. Thank you. And as you know, all this money goes for very, very good cause. And your own colleagues on the World Community Service are doing human service because uh, we're doing global grants, we are doing local grants. And who is next? Ann? Yeah, Lindsay and I both got our first dose of the vaccine, Lindsay on Saturday, me on Monday. And Jill, I'm with you, it, uh, it put me down for for a day or two, uh, had me a little off, but uh, but I'm excited to uh, to be on that road to you know whatever normal is. Thank you, Harriet. Debbie. <laughs> Harriet first. All right, <laughs> hurry up. Right. Debbie is keen, and, and she's and a Jim hard test master. Jim White's in line. So a couple of things. One. Um, I, I got my second shot yesterday and all I have is a little <laughs> ache. So may everybody have a smooth uh, vaccination process. Um, I finished the PETS facilitation, the president-elect training this last weekend, which is awesome. And I've got a district presentation tonight. I'm gonna celebrate tomorrow when the deadlines are done. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I... I'm thankful for so many things. So I'll do $10 for each thing. So I got, I get my second vaccine on Sunday. My husband gets his on Monday. My oldest son who's not here gets his today. My youngest son who is with us today has already been vaccinated. And five, I'm happy that my, I do have great guests in Charlie and Chris today. So that's 50 bucks right there. <laughs> Very good. 
Anybody else? Jim White. Well, there seems to be a theme here with vaccines. Uh, so I'm going to chip in both because of that and because uh, my wife was able to go skiing with me last week. It's been over a year since uh, she tore her ACL and uh, she's back in action. So we had a wonderful ski day and that is truly something to be thankful for along with um, getting my first Pfizer shot. Wonderful, thank you. Troy. So following real quickly on the heels of, of, uh, of Mike's uh, uh, good news there, I do wanna, I do wanna donate. $20 in honor of Mike and his wife, because uh, um, more than a year ago, um, Mike and Lisa and I started pushing the, uh, the evening happy hours on Wednesday nights as proper happy hours. Uh, and those have been virtual for a while. So I am excited that um, Mike getting his first vaccine uh, and then getting a second one in a few weeks is maybe the beginning of getting to have those surgery happy hours in person once again. So $20 in, uh, in, in y'all's honor. Don so, Lewis, and then maybe we, maybe Ved, we can do a last one with John Stewart after Don. Yes, I want to uh, donate in recognition of Eric White, and it's truly a pleasure to see him in the screen today and have him recovered from COVID. And it's uh, it's wonderful to have you here, Eric, and look forward to uh, continuing to see your smiling face. President Debbie, back to you. Oh, do you and, want to do John Stewart real fast? Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, I got my second Moderna shot two weeks ago. Everything's fine. No side effects to speak of. And my daughter and son-in-law just left for their uh, anniversary. They're going to Key West. And uh, so those together are worth 40 bucks. But thank you. And Thank President you so much, Debbie, Ted. I think we're good. And I think uh, our leader, uh, Peg Johnston, tells us how to put in money. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you Jim so White, much. Jim White has had his hand up from the beginning. Oh, we better we better not skip Jim. Yeah, I'm off a of mute now. Uh, I wanted to just put in $60. Uh, to come in uh, basically for for three reasons. Number one, my son, Eric, uh, coming through the COVID. I'm so happy about that. But then secondly, um, a little about the middle of May, I'm heading off to the Grand Canyon to float down the, the rapids with the Colorado School of Mines alumni. And I want to put in $20 for Becky Smith, who is my guest today, who has agreed to uh, join me on that trip up uh, kind of helped me get in and out of the raft. I'm not sure, sure I could do it, but I wasn't able to trust her. So I want to put in another $20 for my grandson, Kevin, who is also going to join me. So I'll have two helpers and I should be able to make the 10 days without uh, too much of a, of a, of a problem. And uh, so that's why I'm, I'm excited about that. So thank you. Well, Jim, that's a good segue regarding a trip on the Colorado River as we introduce our speaker today. I would like to ask Don Kane to introduce our speaker. Don is our program's team member and he's also a retired oil and gas attorney. Don. Thank you, President Debbie and good afternoon, everybody. Club 31 is fortunate to welcome Eric Kuhn as our speaker today on the topic, Water and Science, a conversation about the Colorado River. Eric is the former general manager of the Colorado River District, where he worked for 37 years until retiring a few years ago. For over 20 of those years, he was the top guy, the general manager. The Colorado River District is the largest and oldest of Colorado's four water conservation districts. It covers most of the Colorado River Basin located within Colorado. Of the water that enters the Grand Canyon at the Glen Canyon Dam, at the base of Lake Powell, nearly two thirds originates in or flows through this district. Eric earned his bachelor's degree in engineering from the University of New Mexico and a master's in business administration from 
Pepperdine University. Early in his career, he worked as a naval officer engineer aboard nuclear submarines and as a nuclear engineer for Bechtel Power Corp. After joining the Colorado River District in 1981, he served on the Engineering Advisory Committee of the Upper Colorado River Compact Commission and the Colorado Water Conservation Board. Eric was appointed by Governor Bill Owens as a representative on the Colorado Interbasin Compact Committee. We'll talk about that today. Since retiring in 2018, Eric has written a book titled Science Be Damned, how ignoring inconvenient science drained the Colorado River. The book is an alarming reminder of the stakes in the management or mismanagement of water in the Western US. Eric continues to live in Glenwood Springs near the river he helped to manage for most of his career. With that, I turn the program over to our speaker, Eric Kuhn. Well, thank you. Um, can everyone hear me now? I will get my PowerPoint on board here and start. Um, can you see my screen? It says water and science, a conversation about the river. Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, good. Um, yeah, what I want a little to talk about today in a 20, 25 minutes or so is uh, uh, this, this river that, that uh, has been my career now for 40 years uh, and, and a little bit about its importance uh, to Colorado, indeed, the entire southwestern uh, United States. Uh, talk a little bit about how we use the science in the past and then some of the challenges this river is facing uh, in the future, which are very, very significant. And they come down to one major problem, and that is with climate change and what's happening uh, to uh, the river systems in the western United States through a process uh, that our um, scientists at the University of Colorado and Colorado State and, and others have uh, coined the term aridification. Uh, so as the temperatures get warmer uh, for the same level of precipitation, stream flows are going down. And, and that's not something that would surprise anybody. Uh, the, the hydrologists in the 1920s and 30s could have told us uh, that a warmer atmosphere is going to lead to less flows for the same precipitation. Uh, what's different is they didn't know what would happen uh, as regional temperatures rise due to uh, due to climate change. Now here's Eric, a look. yes. Your slide's not showing. Do you want to go to screen share in the Zoom feature? It's not showing. Let mm -hmm. me. See. Okay. I did go to screen share. And I... A second here. Would you like me to pull them up for you and you can just let me know when you want to change slides? Well, it says I'm here on share, so let's see. Yeah, click the right. <laughs> click this one. Yeah. All right. And then click on. Got it. Got my help. Great. Thank you. All right. Perfect. Yeah, let me go from here. There we go. Um, a little bit about the Colorado River Basin. It covers uh, two nations, uh, nine states, seven of those states in the United States. Colorado is one of them, two in Mexico, uh, 29 Indian tribes, uh, 5 million acres of irrigated farmland. Uh, most of that is in the lower basin uh, down in Arizona and California, where they can irrigate uh, 365 days a year. And it serves about 40 million people, uh, which is much, much larger than the basin, uh, because one of the things about the Colorado River is the Colorado River has become the source of water for places like Denver and Colorado Springs and Cheyenne and the Wasatch Front in Utah uh, and the uh, Southern California Coastal Plain. I'm, I'm currently in, in Pasadena, California for a few weeks helping out with COVID. Uh, uh, grandkid care, uh, which and I'm, I'm loving it. Uh, it's a great opportunity. Uh, but the entire Colorado River uh, is, is a, a resource, not just for the basin, but for all of those communities around the basin. 
including Los Angeles, Denver, Albuquerque, Salt Lake City, Cheyenne, Wyoming. Uh, so it is, it's a major resource. A little thing about this river is that it's, um, even, even though it drains one twelfth of the continental 48 states, and even though um, it's considered one of our major resources, because most of the lands that it drains uh, are really high desert or low desert, uh, its runoff per acre is quite small. Uh, the, in terms of the total natural flow at the mouth, the Colorado River is about the same as the Hudson River. Uh, and you know, the Hudson drains about 1 40th of the land area of the Colorado River Basin and it provides about the same amount of flow. So you can see it's a, it, it is something here. Now, the development of this river started back in the early 1900s. Uh, and uh, it started with uh, Imperial Irrigation District and, and big, big um, irrigation uh, projects in the south, uh, in the southern end of the river system. Uh, and when they went to Congress in the 1920s to get federal help to build what is now Hoover Dam, uh, the folks in the upper basin got a little concerned. Um, they were concerned that if we apply what is Western water laws prior appropriation doctrine, first in time and first is, is first in right, then these big water projects in the lower basin would command all the water and Colorado and its fellow upper river states like Utah and Wyoming and New Mexico wouldn't have a chance to develop the water because all of that water would be destined because of prior appropriation to go to these big projects in the lower basin. Uh, so what did our political folks do, our, our delegation do in 1921 when this legislation was introduced as they said, no, uh, not until we have a compact. Uh, so what the Colorado River Compact does, the one that's almost 100 years, will be 100 years old next year, is really, it's a, it was a social agreement uh, where the faster growing states on the lower river, you can see Arizona, Nevada, California, agreed to leave some water in the system for the slower growing upper states, including Colorado. So that was the, that was the reason for the compact. Um, I won't go into the details, but they, they split the water uh, of the river into three pots, one for the upper basin, one for the lower basin, a little more to the lower basin than the, to the upper basin, and one for future uses. You know, one of the things that, that they did was they used the information that they had available, they thought they had available at the time, and we really only started gauging our rivers in the 1890s. And it just so happened uh, that they were negotiating this compact during what we call the early 20th century pluvial, which is one of the wettest and coolest periods in the Southwest, uh, probably in the last 14 or 1500 years. Now, as far as Colorado is concerned, and I'm showing you a picture of Dillon Reservoir. Um, Dillon Reservoir, I'm sure all of you have been by it on I-70, is actually a project that takes water underneath the Continental Divide into the metro area. It was built by the Denver Water Board. Uh, the Denver Water Board um, serves the city and county of Denver and some surrounding areas. Uh, Denver, I believe, serves about a quarter of the popu Colorado's population. So it's the Colorado River is, because that's where we get our pre most of our precipitation, the, the storms come from the west, except for the one we had last week, at Port, um, unfortunately. Um, it's our largest river. Um, if we looked at the flow at the state line, the Colorado River, and it, and it leaves our state in many, many locations, would be about three times the combined uh, flow of the rest of our rivers, to the Platte, the Rio Grande, and the Arkansas. Almost all of our Front Range cities use some Colorado River water. Uh, Denver, Colorado Springs, Aurora, Low, the, I call them the Northern Front Range cities, uh, that's Boulder, Longmont, Loveland, Greeley, Fort Collins. They all use um, significant Colorado River water. Uh, some, in some cases, it's up to two thirds of the water they divert. Uh, for, for example, Colorado Springs comes from the West Slope. Then the major uses on the West Slope are for irrigation, recreation, and in-stream flow purposes. The number of people we have on the West Slope People 
use by people is not a major um, source of or, uh, use of water on the West Slope, simply because most of the water we use in our homes goes into, um, you know, the in, to our plumbing system and then back into the river. Um, it, it's it's re it's reused. But where, whereas Trans Mountain Diversions, once you take that water out of the river, then it's gone forever. So Colorado, as we say, produces about 70% of the entire system flow of the river, which we use in, in, in the United States, we use a metric called um, an acre foot. Imagine a football field, a, a water, it's 325,000 gallons. It's a football field about a, a foot deep in water. About 70% of that system comes from Colorado's mountains, but most of it, almost 70% of it has to be delivered to downstream states to meet our compact commitments. And that gets us into um, what's the current status of the river? I'll go into the compacts in a second. Um, 2021 will be the second straight drought year. Uh, inflow to Lake Powell is forecast to be less than 50% of average. That's, that's a very, last year it was about 54%. This year it's looking to be around 45%, maybe even as low as 40%. Unfortunately, the Colorado River Basin mostly missed that big storm you had on the Front Range. Uh, the Platte got a good bump in terms of what it's expected, you know, the flows, but the Colorado, with the exception of those areas, just, just a few miles west of the Continental Divide, did not much, get much from this storm. Three of the last four years have been dry. Now, the way this river developed, we started with big storage because we knew the river was variable. Um, it had huge flows at some times, had very dry and other conditions. That's a desert type flow. So the Bureau of Reclamation collectively with the states, um, their efforts in Congress, we've built large, large storage, Lake Powell, Lake Mead, Flaming Gorge, about four times the annual flow of the river can be stored in these big reservoirs. And that storage is now less than 40% full. Uh, 20 years ago, that storage was full. We've sort of drained it, slowly drained it. In some years, it's faster than others. And we've had a few wet years like 2011. But the bottom line is since 2000, and that's a 22 year period now, natural flows, Natural means unaffected by man. The Bureau of Reclamation makes those estimates. It's an engineering calculation. It's not a, it's not a, it's gauge flow plus estimated upstream uses. They've averaged about 18% less than the 20th century average. That's huge. And science has labeled this period a hot drought. And by a hot drought, what we're talking about is precipitation changes are not all that unusual. It hasn't been that dry. Um, what it has been is it has been warm, especially in the springs and the summer. That drives down soil moisture and it reduces runoff. So the Colorado River is facing some really big problems in the future. Now I wanna go back to that law of the river and I don't have time to go into it in detail, but we allocate water in the Colorado River but through compacts, through federal laws, through tr international treaties. Um, the, the Colorado River Compact divided the waters among those two basins. Uh, the Boulder Canyon Project Act authorized Hoover Dam. Uh, the treaty with Mexico gave about 10% of the water to the, to the Republic of Mexico. It's an international treaty that was ratified in 19... Uh, signed in 44, ratified in 45. Uh, the Upper Colorado River Compact divided the Upper Colorado River's basin's share of that water among the four upper basin states, that's Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, and New Mexico. And then in the 50s, we authorized Glen Canyon Dam. Uh, we've had litigation, Arizona v. California, and we've also had uh, of the construction of big projects like the Central Arizona project. So the law of the river is a complicated subject. We go into it in our, into our, in, in our book. And the bottom line there is we allocated more water on paper, even before climate change, than the river has. And we did that um, because in many ways, it was the politically easiest way to get the job done. And we were hoping that something would come up
In the future, we'd fix it. It has 13 million acre feet in it. Um, but we've allocated legally over 17 and a half. Now the future of the river, and I say up here, climate change, climate change, climate change. It's because what we've seen in the last, especially 30 to 40 years, every drop of this water is now, of the river's water is now fairly consumed. Not a drop makes it to the Gulf of Mexico, the mouth of the river. It's fully used by the upper basin, the lower basin, in Mexico. Um, we did have a man-made flood that wetted the, the delta in, in 2014, but that was using stored water. Um, so by itself, the river is now fully consumed. All recent climate science, and, and much of the science originates in Colorado, uh, especially at, at uh, CU and, 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 and uh, CSU, is pointing to a future Whereas regional temperatures rise, the Colorado flows are gonna go down. So remember every drop is used and it's overused. We're drawing down our storage and the future is pointing to a drier, drier system. The bad news is that there are cities in the upper basin that plan to build new projects. And the question has to be, is there really water for these projects? And the answer to that is, personally, I don't believe there is until we get a handle on climate change, but the system isn't gonna react overnight. It will probably take a century or more to bring the system back to a, what we thought was, quote, a normal system. The good news is in the last 10 to 20 years, we've been hugely successful at building conservation projects. Um, cooperation among the, the basin's many, many stakeholders has never been stronger. Um, and what will happen in the next five to 10 years, I think, is critical. When I talk about those conservation efforts, I'll give you uh, both Denver Water and Las Vegas. Uh, when I started working uh, at, the, at the River District in 1981, um, Denver Water was serving about 800,000 people. It was using around 250, 260,000 acre feet per year. Today they serve twice as many, about a million and a half or more. And they only use a tiny bit more water, maybe 270,000 acre feet. So Denver water is serving twice as many people today as it was in 1981 with just a little bit more water. And in some cases, maybe the same amount of water. So conservation has become a reality. Las Vegas is another example. Um, the city of Las Vegas, of course, when the compact was negotiated, had a population of 2,500. And today, there are two and a half million people in the Las Vegas area. In early 2000, we thought that Nevada, which has as a small, it has the smallest allocation of water of, of any of the seven states, we thought that they might fully use their water and we might be headed for litigation or we might be headed for something, you know, the, a real problem because Las Vegas was using more water than it was entitled to. But since 2005, Las Vegas has gone on a conservation effort. And today, Las Vegas serves 50% more people than it did in 2005 with 50% total, almost 50% less water. So Las Vegas has really turned to conservation. Uh, in, in Southern California, you know, Southern California has 20 million people uh, that the metropolitan, what's called the Metropolitan Water District, which imports water from the Northern California and from the Colorado River. Um, they have 37 congressional districts in their, in their service area. They um, at one time were totally relying on Colorado River and, um, uh, state project water. That state water project water is not very reliable because of climate change and because of things, uh, because of other problems uh, in the Delta. So we thought there would be problems there. But what Metropolitan Water District has done is it's gone to recycling and reuse. And today, um, California uses less water from the Colorado River than it did in 1950. So 70 years ago, it was using more Colorado River water than it is today because of conservation. So that cooperation and that conservation is working. 
And the question is, can we make it work for the entire basin? So like I say, the problem today is how do we squeeze a 17 and a half million acre feet of legal rights into a three, 13 million acre foot river and one that is probably shrinking, maybe in 20 years or 30 years, it'll be 12 million acre feet. So a declining water supply, fixed allocations and a growing region and the answer is conservation. And potential solutions, enhanced conservation and recycling projects, especially by the basin's larger municipalities. Agricultural efficiency projects. Agriculture um, uses about 70% of the water, two thirds of the river is, goes to agriculture. And of the remaining, about a sixth goes to people and about a sixth goes to evaporation off those big reservoirs. So the two thirds, unless we really focus on what's going in agriculture, we're, we're not gonna solve the problem. Um, but we've done that. Um, we've started that. Uh, unfortunately, that leads to urban rural conflicts. Um, it's, a, it's a part of the culture we have today, uh, but, but it looks like Colorado um, you know, is in the lead on this in the upper basin and California in the lower basin. It looks like we, we, we're, we're shooting for things like win-win situations where the farmers can be paid uh, to reduce their consumptive use uh, improve their efficiency, and in some cases, they can be pay paid cash instead of crops. Now we're going to see some small-scale desalinization of ocean water and, and brackish groundwater, but primarily in California. Colorado is working on a, what I call a voluntary water bank. Uh, they call it demand management. Uh, demand management is a common term. The you know, the electrical utilities use it. Um, Anyone who provides a resource like electricity or water or even, even uh, transportation, you have to manage your demands. We're doing that now or we're exploring that in Colorado. And then I want to talk a little bit finally about storage. You hear a lot in the paper about storage. Well, on a river that is declining and on a river where a sixth of its consumptive use goes to evaporation, we're not going to see any more big reservoirs, but we're going to need, we're going to see targeted smaller reservoirs. In the lower basin, they've really done efforts on underground storage. There's no evaporation on underground storage, especially in the lower basin uh, and in Arizona where evaporation is quite high. And in the upper basin, we're also looking at storage. Denver water is, is looking at at uh, enlarging gross reservoir another in order to get it through longer what we expect will be longer droughts and others are looking at targeted storage as well so storage has its benefits it but it also has its its problems one of the problems of course is where do you cite them and and will that evaporation add to the problem um, here's a Finally, I'll leave it and we'll go to questions. Here's Colorado River water use since 1906. The upper basin is in the blue. Um, you can see beginning about 19, oh, 19, mid 1980s, it's been flat, maybe even a slight decline. Here in the upper the lower basin, you can see it peaked about 2000 at over 8 million and it's been in a steady decline since. Um, so the good news is the bad news, of course, is climate change is really impacting this river. Um, the good news is um, conservation efforts and cooperative programs so far have been able to handle it. So with that, I think I'm on schedule to take questions. All right, I do. This is Debbie. Thank you so much. I do have a number of questions queued up. So let me start from the top. Um, if you want to unshare, then we can see your face better. There, perfect. There we go. Uh, what is the history of changing the name from Grand to Colorado? Yeah, all right, that's a great story. Um, in 1921, the, the, the Grand River began, uh, well, from its origins, it started up in Grand County, um, went through places like uh, Grand Junction, down to uh, into Utah, where we it was commonly where we now have the 
Canyonlands National Park where it met up with the green. So the Colorado began at the Grand and the Green. The Colorado River, that was, that, that was the beginning of the Colorado River. Um, Wyoming and Colorado had a little bit of a, of a, of a uh, let's say, a competition. Uh, the Wyoming's one delegate to, the, to Congress wanted the Green River to be named the Colorado. And I think Colorado's three delegates or three members of the House wanted the, wanted the Colorado to be, or the Grand to be renamed the Grand. So in 1921, Congress won, and, or I mean, Colorado won, and Congress changed the name of the Grand Stem of the Colorado, it's, it was, we call it now, uh, to the Colorado. And, and what Colorado had going for it was that's our state name, right? So how can how can we not how can we have a not have a river in it that's called the Colorado when that's our state name? Great. Here's a here's a good one. Regarding climate change, what do you say to people who don't believe that humankind has had any real impact on climate change? And there's little point in trying to protect our rivers because the planet's just going to do what it's going to do. Well, you know, the climate has always been changing. I understand it, but it's the rate of that change that is really, really impacting it. I don't think there's anyone, that, any scientist that I've ever heard that doesn't believe that a greenhouse works. Uh, that's why when you shut your door, car doors in the middle of the summer that your, your car heats up. Um, the greenhouse is a reality. Greenhouse is, is just, is, it's, it's as simple as gravity in terms of, phys in terms of the physics of it. Um, I have, I understand their skepticism. I think though that all they need to do is look at, does a greenhouse work? Uh, and if so, why? Uh, and if we're adding carbon dioxide to the, to the environment and methane, um, and, and there, it's complicated, of course, um, what are we doing to a system? And it's that rate of change. And I think the Colorado has sort of become the smoking gun, the Colorado River and the Rio Grande and others, because nature delivers climate change through hydrologic changes. It's going to see, we're going to see wetter storms in places like the east, and we're going to see bigger droughts. And that's coming true. Here's a question. Does the BLM consider river flow for rafters? The, the BLM, Bureau of Land Management, well, the, the rivers are managed primarily by the states. But in the Colorado River Basin, we do have programs to enhance rafting to the extent we can operate our major, um, our in-system, in-state storage. So recreation is a huge issue. The, the district I used to manage um, we, we tried to manage the reservoir system we have, including um, cooperation with Denver and the United States, so that we had good flows in the Colorado River and in the, certain, in the reaches in Grand County and in, say, the Shoshone Reach above Glenwood Springs uh, when, there was good, when there was good rafting. And that goes together with water quality management and fish flows. So they all seem to work together. But yes, we take, we take rafting into consideration when we're operating our reservoirs. Next came in, uh, first comment, great presentation. And then have you read The Water Knife, which is about the life of the Colorado River in the future 20 to 30 years? And do you see it as a possible outcome? And how close are we to that type of water allocation crisis? Um, I think that we are close depending on our behavior. And when I say if we continue the cooperation, um, if we continue the, the um, leadership that we have in the basin uh, where we're not fighting with each other and instead we're trying to figure out how, what the solution is, um, I, I think we have a brighter future than what's shown in the, the water knife. Um, if we break, if that cooperation breaks down, um, then I think the water knife is probably a, um, it's, its message is gonna happen. But it all depends on our behavior. It depends on how we, we work with others in, in the, for, the, for managing this natural resource. You mentioned incentives that governments are offering to farmers to improve their water use efficiency. 
Are there any programs that are aimed to specifically equip farmers with the tools needed to improve their efficiency? Oh, yes. Uh, the Soil Conservation Service, the Bureau of Reclamation, uh, even the state of Colorado, uh, the Colorado Water Conservation Board has, has have many programs to provide incentives um, to uh, for farmers to improve their efficiency and improve how they apply the water through through uh, drip systems and and better irrigation techniques instead of flood irrigation. Um, we, we're lining canals. Um, we have we spend a lot of money in this basin on improving efficiency, and there are many many incentives to do so. I, I believe the last farm bill had in the billions of dollars available nationwide for improving efficiency. It's a, it's a major goal um, of the farm bill, the recent farm bill. And I think we've got time for this last question. My understanding is that Lake Mead and to a lesser extent Lake Powell are filling up with silt. Is that accurate? What percentage of the reservoirs are still available for water storage? They are filling up with silt, but at a much slower rate, um, especially now that we built Lake Powell so that stopped a major source of silt for Lake Mead. So Lake Mead is the only minor. Lake Powell um, is filling up, but most of it's happening at the front end. So the estimates are that it has at least a two to 300 year more life before it becomes a problem. Um, so it will fill up eventually, um, but it's gonna take centuries, not years. Very good, what a great presentation. One of Rotary's, our primary international goal is to eradicate polio. So in your honor, we will donate to have 33 children inoculated against polio. And oh, with good. the two for one match by Bill and Melinda Gates, that actually is 100 children in your honor. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed having this. Um, I'm looking, my wife and I are heading back to Colorado to our home in Glenwood Springs here in a, in a couple of weeks, but we've also enjoyed our time with our grandkids. So th thank you so much for inviting me. It's a great subject. And I would just ask everybody to, uh, you've got a great uh, leadership in Denver, in the Denver area on water issues and, and, and encourage them to continue cooperation. We will, and you're always invited, Eric. So if you ever wanna join us again, please do. Our next meeting is next week, new, new time though. So it is our April Fool's Untalent Show fundraiser for your Denver Rotary Club Foundation. The meeting will be in the evening from 5.30 to seven by Zoom. Don't forget to pre-register and make your pledge to support our 2022-23 Denver Rotary Club Foundation grantees. So with that, please join me in reciting the Rotary four-way test. Of the things we think, say, or do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? So with that, we are adjourned. Thank you very much. See you next week with your April Fool's caps on. <laughs>